imagine taking your generosity to the next level, impacting more lives and leaving a godly legacy for generations to come. Get ideas and strategies to do just that when you listen to these personal stories from high-level kingdom champions. The Kingdom Investor Podcast showcases business leaders who have moved from success to significance, sharing how they use worldly wealth for kingdom impact. Discover how they grew in generosity, impacted more lives, and built godly legacies. You'll find motivation, inspiration, and practical steps to grow as a kingdom investor. Welcome, Vip Vipperman. How are you doing today? Fantastic. Glad to be here, Daniel. Awesome. Would you get us started with a word of prayer? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Father in heaven, we thank you for today. Just this opportunity to come together and chat a little bit about experiences and things we've done in the world and, and the, the journey that you've taken us on. We do pray for this, our conversation that it might honor you today. And just for listeners, Father, that those out there trying to process through what it means to be you know, walk in their faith and live it out in their like life and business and investments and entrepreneurship, Lord, that you would just help us to, to have open ears, to hear open hearts, to understand Lord, and even open eyes to see what you're doing around us, Lord, that's maybe so obvious drawing us into this conversation. And yet sometimes we just miss it. It's almost like we have blinders on Father. So remove the blinders, Father, help us to see clearly and to hear what you might have for us today. Lord, and if there's anything keeping us from taking that next faithful step with you, that you would help just listeners out there today to make that a decision to hand it over to you, trust you with it and see all the amazing things that you can do. So we love you, Lord. Pray that through this conversation today, we and, and those listening might savor you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Vip. Where are you coming from today? Yeah, I'm in the Dallas, Texas area, McKinney to be exact, a little, little Northeast of the, the DF in the DFW Metroplex, but. Gotcha. And what do you do now? And can you share a little bit of how you got into that? Yeah, I work as a vice president at a venture capital firm called Eagle Venture Fund. So we're a faith-based or values aligned venture fund based in the DFW area, as well as Zurich, Switzerland. So we do European and American investments in early stage technology companies, typically B2B SaaS is our sweet spot. And so have a great time getting a chance to be a part of this team. Yeah, I started out, I mean, just a quick background, you know, I started out in more of a ministry context. I had come to faith when I was in middle school, kind of time frame. a guy, you know, I, uh, you know, a friend of mine or, or a guy that came to our church, a youth, new youth minister and said he had come from a, a background of radical addiction and he had gotten saved and you know he, the lord took him out of that it really changed his life a lot and so he really had a heart for other youth to kind of want to know the lord want to not have the experience he'd had with you know drugs and addiction and those kind of things and so when we got to know each other my problem wasn't those issues you know that wasn't the thing but i had grown up a real chub chubby kid had you know, braces and acne and glasses and was overweight all at the same time which was just ripe punishment and bullying, you know, in the middle school, high school, like early high school environment. Right. And so, you know, I just struggled a lot with that and ended up, you know, when, once I got to know him, he really spent some time and just said, Hey, really doesn't matter. You know, what those kids are saying about you. doesn't matter what you're thinking about yourself because you know, there is a God in heaven who loves you. He sent his son to die for you. That's what matters most. And if you can, you know, get on board with that, then there's a lot more to life that he has for you than just worrying about what other these other kids are saying. So it, it took a little while for that to really sink in. But once the Lord re redeemed me, gave me a heart for him, it just really gave me a heart for other people, for that person who was like me, that was on the, the periphery, the edge, the, you know, whatever, however you want to say it, the one not included in the center of the conversation. And so that's meant different things throughout my life, but ended up doing some youth ministry and college, you know, student work in, you know, when I was in college, that took me overseas to Taiwan. I got a chance to do some missions work over there, sports kind of engagements, ended up, you know, coming back to the state states, having found to my wife went on trips in Taiwan. She had come over as a college student there. And so I came back, went to seminary in the U S my master's degree is in missiology. So not in finance, economics, or 
you know, any of those kind of typical things that you might think of when you're working in the full-time investment space. Don't have the MBA. My master's is in missiology, which is the study of missions, but really got a great education on the study of cross culture and then just understanding how to engage other cultures. So ended up going to China, working with the underground church there for about six years, starting a small consulting business there just to do outreach and ministry, but had an incredible experience, like getting to see God work through, you know, the underground church, that part of the world. And then about 2012, got it. It was time for us to come back. I just made a plane to come back to the States. So brought, you know, wife, two kids, one on the way, came back. And honestly, we had no idea what was next for us. You know, a lot of people hit that halftime kind of moment in their life when they've been successful in business or had some business experience. And they're like, you know, starting to have that, uh, was it discontent, you know, a smoldering discontent as the guys at halftime refer to it as, and you know, they, they start looking at, oh, what's the ministry that I can jump into, or how can I do more nonprofit work or something like that, have more significance or six, you know, legacy. For me, it was kind of, I started with the missions work, you know, that was the way that God called us from the beginning. And then when I came back to the States, he really started drawing me over to the business world. And so it was, it was quite a transition for us to do that, but the Lord, you know, provided some business men in the area to coach and mentor, teach me about it. You know, a guy gave me some suit, another guy gave me a, a nice car to drive and I got a great job. I was working with a ministry. One of the donors said, Hey, why don't you come over and work for our real estate company? We've seen a lot of capital come out of Asia where you just spent time. We'd really like to have someone who spoke Chinese to work with us. So he invited me to come work for his company, he hired me, even though I didn't have any real estate experience, but they needed the Mandarin Chinese language experience that I had. And so it came over, worked for them, you know, the suits, the car, it, it was a perfect fit. And the coaching those guys had given to me just really helped enable me to, to get rolling. So we started with single family houses, moving into master plan communities and ended up, you know, doing $300 million apartment complex deals in LA. Again, completely because of God's generosity. It wasn't like we were stepping into the room, knowing exactly what we're doing. You know, some of the relationships just kind of happened. I mean, it would feel like by chance for, you know, but you know, people in the world would say, you know, completely coincidentally, and yet we just knew God was in charge and we were praying that way. Right. Like, so, you know, because I got, I had a background in missions and got into the institutional investment world, I got invited to an event called the lion's den. It was a shark tank for Jesus event in Birmingham, Alabama. And the guys there were in investments and, and business, but they also had a lot of, you know, their faith and they were trying to figure out. In their church experience, they didn't get a chance to live out their faith that much, you know, through church programs, those kind of things. So they got invited to come be, they wanted to do something besides, you know, that the typical mission trip. And they're like, well, if we invite business owners to the church, we can consider it, you know, or to like to eat at some restaurants in town, share about their deal. We could get involved in their lives a little bit, invest in their companies. And then, Hey, they'll provide reports to us. We'll get to see some of the impact they make. Maybe we might actually make money instead of just donating it, you know, over to them and stuff. So I went to the event, had a great time, ended up wanting to bring it back to Dallas and a few other folks, I said, Hey, that'd be a you know, great thing to do. So we talked to them. They, you know, allowed us to kind of take the, the, the idea, the concept, the name and bring it back here, just make a promise that we'd never do the event in the fall. Like they did. So we did a six month rotation where they were doing it every fall. And we decided to do it in Dallas every spring. And just got open doors here with Dallas Baptist University to host the event and you know, you know, a lot of other folks after that. So you know, now we're seven years into that and it's, you know, grown significantly. We're just really thankful again for the Lord's generosity. When we started the event, I didn't know the difference between series, you know, a investments and, and seed investments did not have any, a clue what I was looking at when I was talking about technology deals. And yet the Lord just kind of slowly enabled us to really come to an understanding of that and, and get to know, you know, that space a whole lot better through the experience, a lot of great, you know, coaches and mentors along the way. So it's been a lot of fun, ended up staying in, in the real estate business for quite some time, worked for a large multifamily developer. And then about two, three years ago, I got invited by Henry Kaysner to come work for faith driven investor and entrepreneur. So great organization based out of San Jose, California, just really passionate about equipping entrepreneurs and investors all over the world. And so got a chance to be a part of that organization, grow and develop, you know, from a marketplace platform to help entrepreneurs you know, raise capital and investors find deals to, you know, do a lot of different things in that realm, I started community groups and, and helped kind of build some programs there. And then most recently, a few months ago, got invited to join this team at the venture capital fund. And so it's been a lot of fun continuing to be a part of starting those community groups. Cause I still think investors and entrepreneurs really need community to be successful in this space. 
there's just a lot of folks struggling out there, but, you know, passionate now about actually helping bring the capital to help these entrepreneurs get funding and, and to build these great businesses and to really just help enable some of the investors who don't know how to do the diligence. You know, they've raised the money or they've made the money. They are excited about supporting some of the work of the kingdom or, 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 you know, multiplying their money through investing, but a lot of them, you know, still aren't quite sure how. And so just spending a lot of time, you know, trying to coach and support and, you know, help investors kind of figure out, Hey, where's their, where are their passions at? What are the things that they're going to be excited about and uh, you know how to really build their thesis for their family, like around how they're going to invest, what it's going to be in that sort of thing. So a little bit of that coaching, mentoring kind of stuff. That's fun. But anyway, that's a little bit longer of the story, but uh, I'm version of the story, but that's kind of the, the, pretty much the, the summary of it. A uh, really, again, just a story of God's generosity and it, you know, that redemption story, I always started out with that, you know, when I was a kid, because I think it really gave me a, a heart for like in, in this realm, that, that beginning entrepreneur that, especially in that frontier market area or something like that, is that one who needs to be brought in. You know, they've got this great idea that God's given them, but they don't have access to the capital or, you know, know how to, you know, sometimes make some of the things happen. And so really trying to come along and support them and help them you know, get to, you know, get, get, get to success with their, you know, and realize their vision as well for that investor. I mean, sometimes, you know, they've been doing it alone. Suddenly they come into some capital that they've made, but just trying to, again, to help them figure out, you know, what does it look like for me to not live this way with this capital and how do I want to steward it well, without being just totally attacked by people from every side who are trying to get that money out of me. So. It's, it's a fun conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. That sounds really amazing what God is doing to yeah. be different relationships and people together and different businesses and investments. That's interesting that, you know, you were sharing about how it's like all, almost already pre-planned <laughs> and it's, you know, we're getting glimpses of what God is doing around the world and across the country. And it's just mind blowing and really inspires and, and you know, makes me want to get involved at least in what God is doing around the world. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I, I would say the work is accelerating. Like 10 years ago, when we got the, the Lions Den event, you know, about 10 years ago, we got the Lions Den event started. There was just like one or two other organizations we knew in the world that were really actively doing a lot of this stuff and faith and entrepreneurship and investing. Now there's, you know, tons of them out there, you know, initially when we started the Lions Den, there was one fund, Sovereign's Capital, that was investing in these faith-based founders actively. You know, now there's 50 or more. And so, you know, and, and I say 50 or more, not all of them are investing just in the faith-based founders, but they're faith-based fund managers trying to invest from a place of faith and really wanting to bring their faith into the conversation with those are investing. In. But it, I mean, it's amazing just to see, you know, that growth in such a short amount of time. And even in the real estate deals, it's, you know, before it was kind of like, you know, people were building, you know, houses, building properties again with the capital in mind, but it's been neat to hear in the last you know, five or 10 years, just some of the incredible stories from you know, guys building industrial to especially multifamily, single family, you know, that kind of thing to do it with kind of an impact motive and really wanting to, you know, either minister to residents living in their houses or the apartments that they've built, you know, minister to the, you know, folks that are in there, the commercial buildings through co-working and coffee shops and just bringing in faith-based coffee businesses into those buildings so that there's somebody on site that's kind of got a faith that's wanting to be shared, you know, all the way to, to the investors and, and those kind of things as well. So it's, it's just incredible to see how it's grown and the opportunities that, I mean, whether you're doing real estate investing, you know, early stage investing, private equity investing, you know, or even in the stock market itself, there's tons of ways to bring your faith into the conversation that it, it to say it didn't exist before would be wrong, but. It's grown so significantly in the last few years, especially even, yeah, the public markets too. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate <laughs> and, and credit you for some of the connections that I've been able to make and, and how you've been able to connect me with different people. And I'm already starting to see how God is working in, in Lexington, Kentucky, our city and what he's doing through different churches and different apartment owners and their interest in you know, using the real estate that they own to impact their tenants and, and make a difference. And it's really cool to see, you know, all these things start to be put in motion here that we've seen modeled in these different cities. Yeah. One of the things I kept noticing was, you know, it really helps if you find a cause or a place that you care a lot about. Hmm. I mean, in for the apartment owners and stuff like that, and, you know, there's some folks out there that, 
you know, they, they really care about refugees. And so they really wanted to employ and focus on like employing and using refugees as workers in a lot of their apartment complexes. Right. Um, that just was, you know, some of the others, you know, they're passionate about trafficking or slavery and they're like, Hey, we want to give, you know, single moms or, or folks that have had challenging, you know, they're survivors of challenging issues, you know, cheaper rent on their apartments or those kind of things. Just, you know, one of the guys I know is big in single family, had a big passion for mission work overseas. And then he realized in his town, hundreds of, or if not thousands of Asian students were coming to live. So he started buying rental properties, you know, renting out the rooms, like five or six you know, students at a time, you know, using one of his houses and go maybe take them a meal once a week or once a month and, you know, just share with them during the time that they're in his apartment. So it's, it's incredible that you could, you know, uh, is once you figure out the, the kind of passion that it is, whether it's hunger or trafficking or, you know, slavery or, you know, education, then you can apply your experience and knowledge to it. And then once you nail the place, you know, whether it's, you know, in your own backyard or, you know, somewhere overseas, you know, frontier market, 1040 window, whatever really gets you excited, you know, to combine those things together is, is so powerful and really helps people to kind of dig in, in particular. Absolutely. So I wanted to move into really drilling down on some key pivotal moments in your life, in your journey from success to significance and talk about those. And I think one of the things that we, we want to talk about is just how when God calls us to something bigger than ourselves, it's a lot of times hard to make that leap of faith, but it's so critical. And one of the books that I'm reading is by Mark Batterson, Chase the Lion. I haven't mm -hmm. gotten a chance to read that yet, but it's phenomenal. And I just wanted to read this quote just to kind of set this section up. So it says, in every dream journey, there comes a moment when you have to quit living as if the purpose of your life is to arrive safely at death, you have to go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. And mm -hmm. kind of the, the idea behind that is that God is calling, to so, calling us to something that is bigger than ourselves that we can't accomplish on our own because in that we realize that it's not us that's accomplishing it. It's him and he gets the yeah. For it. And so I just wanted to ask you if you have a moment in your life like that, that you can maybe share with us. Yeah. Sorry. It just made me think of like, I think it's Jonathan and his armor bearer in the old Testament when they're climbing up the, you know, a cliff or whatever. And they're like, Hey, we're going to get to the top. And our bearer's like, how are we going to know this right. is going to work out for us? And Jonathan's just like, well, if they come up, you know, threaten us or whatever, then we're going to go after it. And we're just going to trust that the Lord's in it. And if they don't, we'll just kind of head out, you know, head home. But it was kind of funny where they, he was just like, Hey, we're just going to trust the Lord with this one and, and take this leap. You know, the, in my prayer, the, the question, the question you just asked in the prayer, when we got started, that's exactly what I was thinking in that, you know, I was in a room on the mission field, you know, geez, close to 20 years ago now. And the guy who was the supervisor for our summer project, there are probably 10 or 15 of us in the room. He said, Hey, what is one thing keeping you from taking this next step with God? Like, so first we were talking about, you know, a little bit about you know, God's got this call in our life. We're just, you know, God's you know, got a vision for what he wants to do through us and, you know, all that equipping, you know, supporting, challenging us. But he was like, all right, here's the deal. What's the one thing? Write it on this little piece of paper. I mean, just like straight up, put it down. Like, what are you afraid of that's keeping you from taking that step? And then, you know, we prayed over it. It was like, hey, let's pray that, you know, just lay it at the feet of Jesus, that kind of thing. I think we ended up taking a little piece of paper, folding it up, putting it in an ashtray and like burning it. Just kind of like, let's totally give it up. Like wow. this is completely not ours anymore. And, you know, there's something about kind of voicing, you know, committing to it. And we didn't share it with the people in the room, but just voicing that to the Lord saying, Hey, this is yours. I want to trust you with it. That's really powerful for me at the time. Like honest, I was looking, felt like God was calling me into the mission field because that was at that stage of my life. And I really didn't want to do it alone. Like I really was hoping to go with someone else, like to have a spouse, to be a part of that conversation with me in the journey, you know, different people have different things. That's kind of that one thing holding them back. Ironically, my wife today was in the room. So I wrote down spouse on that piece of paper. I'm just kind of trying to trust him with that thing. Like, Hey Lord, if you want to do this, great. If you don't, I'll trust you that it's your timing. Funny enough, she wrote the same thing on the piece of paper and it, you know, it took 
probably six months before the two of us connected. And I don't think we even realized the, that we had written that on the paper for until years later, but it was just kind of interesting how sometimes you just kind of hand something over to him completely. And it really makes a difference. So, I mean, if that's, you know, capital, I know sometimes, you know, we've had the lion's den events, we've had people come in there and just exited their company. I'm like, Hey, I'm sitting on, you know, $50 million. I really just don't know what's next for me. Played golf for the first, you know, three months or whatever, you know, went on a couple trips to Europe or something like that, you know, done some fishing, that kind of thing. Now I'm just kind of sitting around the house bored and just not know what that next step is. And, you know, a lot of times her wife's kind of encouraging them to move along and find something else to do. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it's like, you don't want to necessarily jump into another start of a business. Cause like, Hey, I, I've done that. Like I've had that experience. I don't need to start from scratch again and go through all the pain, but to invest alongside an entrepreneur to come along with them for the ride, you get to be a part of the journey and experience some of the ups and downs of it and kind of coach them through it, but there's not quite the same pressure. Right. And so that I've seen be successful. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is one of a guy named Barzillai in the old Testament, a friend of David who, when David it, was run out of Jerusalem because Absalom and him were fighting at the time, Barzillai was the guy that was in the wilderness, kind of took care of him and his family. And says took care of him in the wilderness. It doesn't sound like it was tent camping. I mean, that, you know, David had his entire entourage, entourage with him and Barzillai took care of, Barzillai took care of all of them in the wilderness with food and like shelter and all those kind of things. I mean, the guy, it says he was a wealthy man, but then right as David's, you know, Absalom gets killed, David's going back into Jerusalem. He turns to, to Barzillai and says, Hey, let's go back across the river together. Why don't you come? And for the rest of your days, I'll take care of you in my home in Jerusalem. Sit at the table of the king and he says, no, nah, I'm good. Which is kind of funny. You're like, man, opportunity of a lifetime. Let's go sit at the table of the king. And he says, no, I honestly just want to go back home, you know, be with my family, die on my own land, but take this guy, Chim Ham with you. You know, he take him in my stead, give him the table at your, the seat at the table and the opportunity. And it's kind of, you know, people have said, you know, what do you, when you see a turtle on your turtle on a fence post, what do you know? Like he didn't get there by himself because he's not going to climb a stick and fence post. And it, you know, Chim Ham has this moment where he's suddenly at the table of the king. And it's like, he didn't get there by himself. It's completely just generosity of God and generosity of the guy at Barzillai. But his life in an instant changes. And I find that an investor, a lot of times, you know, who's someone who's had that capital opportunity, you know, suddenly has that power. Like the Lord's given them that opportunity to steward where they can turn it back over and say, who is this Chim Ham in my life? Who's that? person I'm mentoring or coaching that entrepreneur or that, you know, that group, they can put a little bit of capital behind them and actually see them take a, just a jump forward, like a leap forward. And sometimes it's not always capital, as you said in before, you know, time, talent, treasure, it could be just relationships or other things like that, that they make. I mean, again, Chim Han connected to David makes all the difference in the world. It wasn't like, you know, Barzillai necessarily wrote a check, but it was the equivalent, right? Um, so anyways, I found that those guys that were in my life, they had come and served on a mission trip. They'd been a AT&T executives. They'd come served on a mission trip when I was in China and we'd done some consulting with local Chinese companies and I just kind of tried to share the gospel through business conversations. I think we're teaching marketing and some stuff like that at the time. When I came back to the States, it was those guys who really, you know, you know, came beside me. You know, one of the guys was the one who gave me the suits really taught me about business, what it looked like to live in the business world. And then whenever I had a business question, it was kind of there to answer it. They were kind of that, you know, Barzillai type for me at the time. And it really was powerful. So anyways, I think, I think that kind of answers the question. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you had mentioned the framework of time, talents, and treasure and how we can invest those in God's kingdom. Is there a particular one of those that you gravitate towards? And can you share a little bit about that? Well, I'll be honest. So in, in Chinese, there's like Ren Chen and Shi Jian, which is almost the, you know, like relationships, money, and the time, which, you know, kind of rhyme in, in, well, at least in the Chinese kind of rhyme, Ren Chen, Shi Jian. But in that way, I always, so because of my missions background, because the trajectory of the career that I had, I was not, I was in the running the Lions Den event in conversations with very wealthy investors in the institutional investment space, and yet was not the person with significant capital, um, in the part of that conversation, you know, you know, our family was, you know, regular middle-class kind of growing up. So it wasn't like we 
been very poor, you know, so had all the things I needed and stuff like that, but just was never on the, you know, 2% ultra high net worth kind of trajectory. And so I felt like for a ton, there was nothing I could do in the space. Like, how am I going to be able to help this entrepreneur? How am I going to be able to serve the community if I'm not the person with the capital to invest in it? And what did I discovered was God didn't care. He wanted me to be a available to him. And so, I mean, you know, running the lion's den event, convening the people, bringing the investors into the conversation, I was putting more of the time and talent in instead of the, the money piece. And it, it turns out that by doing that, we were able to bring significantly more capital into the conversation. And we've seen lion's den companies raise, you know, more than 20 million in the real estate, I mean, in the real estate deals, we got to see you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at work. And then just in the last few years at Faith Driven, investor and entrepreneurs through their marketplace and the demo days we were running, I mean, 50 or more companies were getting funded in a year. So again, I was not the person writing those checks, but I was helping to build the systems, helping to build the platforms, helping to convene the people to do it. And the Lord was working through all of that. Right. So I guess my point in that would be, I wanted to be the money guy. I just felt like that's what the calling, you know, that's what it, my flesh maybe wanted. And God was like, you don't need to be that guy. You can use what I've given you, which is your time and your, you know, friendliness as it were to convene the folks, get the right people in a room and then let, let me get the capital from wherever I want to. And then a lot of times the same way with the Lions and events, you know, early on, we were always, God always reminded us that it was his event, not our event. And our theme on our team is like, God creates the waves. We're not the one who creates the waves. Like we're not going to force you know, waves to, to get started. We want to see where God's moving the wave that he's created and then ride that. So, you know, in the, the lion's in event, you know, I thought if we had a famous speaker or something like that, that it would really get people there and make it a lot more exciting. And you know, the Lord was just like, no, it's not going to be this one famous person to bring the crowds. It's going to be more grassroots. I want the people who need, need the help to be there the entrepreneurs, and I want the people who want to help to be there, those investors with that Barzillai type mindset, but it, it wasn't about just, you know, who's the, who's the person that can draw them in. So that's yeah, more on the time, talent experience and really relationships. I think the, when you say time, talent, treasure, I think, you know, you can include some other things in that. Um, I've heard people say, you know, time was the time treasure and mentoring or time, money and mentoring. A lot of different ways of saying it. The one thing for me, though, the, the relationships piece, I find that the thing that I really get excited about is when I can help people connect to really add value to their lives. And I don't know if everybody is, is that excited about that, but it, you know, just trying to help that person, you know, find the, the next person that will help them succeed. I may not have the answers for you, but this person might, that's where I've found probably my most joy. And the most, you know, solid experiences that the Lord has used. Yeah, I would agree with you there. Like one of the, one of the highlights and unexpected highlights of the last year has been just being able to meet people around the country and get on a zoom call or, or get on a phone call and hear their story, hear what they're trying to do and say, Hey, you got to connect with this other person that's doing something similar or, you know, just being, being there and, and being able to be that connector has been really a neat experience that. And life-giving for you, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. God created his people to be in community, right? Like Adam was, had all the great animals, but he was alone, right? So God created a, you know, a helper for him. It says, you know, for someone else to be there. And I just, you know, working with Faith Driven the last two years, seeing the value of entrepreneurs finding a community and investors finding community. Now, I really hope that Kingdom Equity through this podcast, through the listeners out there today, you guys will find a community to come alongside the, the, the listening to the engaging and actually get to know one another and, and really see the value of what that can mean for the, for the kingdom and for them, you know, for the, for the individual. Absolutely. So our, in, our listeners really want to grow in their generosity and impact more lives and leave a godly legacy. And so can you speak to, to, to that in investments in particular, since you've done a lot of work with different investors and investments and maybe give us a little bit of advice on things that you've seen work really well. Yeah. Guy at a conference I went to recently, I went to the Praxis Innovation Summit not so long ago and he said, you know, 
he, he'd been in the wealth space for 30 plus years. He say, you know, the wealthiest people, you know, sometimes they'll write a $5,000 check, which seems pretty big or $10,000 check and even, but you know, they may just write one of those a year. Some of them. Now there's some people I know that write million dollar checks every year, right? Like they're capable of doing that and that kind of thing. But he said, you know, it's the person that gives a hundred bucks a week, you know, for the next 20 years, just that consistency. That's like a hundred thousand dollars, that consistent generosity. You know, that's the Lord honors that and really uses it. You know, one of the things that we found, there was a, uh, one of the entrepreneurs that we got to know over the last couple of years, a guy named Stephen Kump with a company called Charity Vest. CharityVest.org is their website. They do free donor advice funds. And so you can, you know, connect it up to your bank account. You can get a tax deduction by putting some money into it. And then you can grant out of that account to the things that you care about. So it's great for someone who's had a really good year in the real estate business or you know, really good year at work. You get your bonus. You want to put an extra, you know, chunk of change and get your tax deduction for this year into that account and then be able to give it away, you know, immediately or over the next three or four years. Such a cool, you know, idea. It has been so fun because we'll put the money in there as a family. Like, uh, you know, I had a, even though I wasn't in real estate as actively still kept my real estate license and had a really great property that I referred over closed. And so someone gave me the referral, man, it was so fun. I mean, we got a chance to put a, a piece of that into that donor advice fund and they give it away over the next, you know, six, 12 months or something. And it just, our family, even like the kids were kind of like, Hey, what would be fun to give to, you know, what organization would be something you'd be interested or something like that. You know, there's a website now called donor C where you can actually watch a little video of the people you want to give to, and then, you know, hear them telling their story and what they need it for. Right. It's like, you know, almost like Kickstarter for, for the nonprofit, but, um, and sometimes they'll put the video of the person once they've got the money and getting restored, like, you know, had an accident, got hurt you know, was able to afford their medical bills and, you know, in the bandages and, and healed up. And so just getting them to kind of see, but I think we've found in doing that, it's like, this is free money over here. Like I've already set it inside. We've already, you know, chosen to put it there. And now it's just fun to give it away because there's not the burden anymore. And you're just like, oh man, like had a great conversation with that person today. It sh let's give to, to their organization, the work that they're doing. It really sounds powerful. And so I think, you know, having the donor advice fund, setting it up for free and just having it there and putting the first hundred bucks in it, man, I think that's powerful for what, you know, people want to do in their generosity. As far as one of the, the trends we're seeing and working with like the high net worth, you know, crowd and stuff like that is people are starting to say, Hey, I'd like to put our investments and our charity in similar directions. So one of the things we've been doing at, you know, Eagle Venture Fund, we started a fund or we're working on starting a fund focused on the anti-trafficking and slavery space, right? So there's a lot of people passionate about that. They might donate to IJM, who's kind of helping on the justice side, or they might donate to a local, you know, home for survivors, like people who get out of trafficking need a place to stay. You know, and somebody might do, you know, an investment in education for those folks. So it's a, you know, education grant for them to go back to school so they can get educated to do it, but they're not investing in that space because they couldn't figure out what to invest in. Well, we've discovered, you know, we realized a chunk of the companies that we we're investing in, in our technology had something to do with the anti-trafficking space, supply chain, supply chain transparency, you know, job creation technology, you know, education technology. And, you know, we said, wow, we could start a fund and actually carve off a chunk of this, you know, venture, you know, venture fund that we had before and say, Hey, let's open up some investments where you can invest directly in technologies. So B2B SaaS still like our sweet spot, B2B SaaS and tech enabled services, but all those services are creating things, solving problems that are in that, that lead to slavery and trafficking, right? So you can put, then you can also put your donations alongside that thing that you care about that you're investing in. And the same thing, like if you're thinking that I really care about, you know, lostness, well, you may donate to, you know, an organization in your town that does like whatever door-to-door -door evangelism or, you know, prints gospel tracks. And that's kind of the old school, you know, way of doing it or, you know, a Bible, you know, ministry, but you also can, you know, put an investment in an apartment complex that's doing door-to-door you know, -door ministry in the apartment building to the residents, right? And so it's your investments are in the same thing that your donations have been, or your charity is passionate about. Again, it all goes back to figuring out where your passions lie, you know, what's the place, what's the cause that you really want to support 
And then you can put your charity alongside your investments into those so, so that they run together. And it gets exciting because you can see, you can start seeing this, the needle move a lot more. Cause you're like, man, this great organization is doing all this work, like getting these women out of trafficking into this home, but then they don't know what to do next with them. You know, they, most of the time it's like getting them a restaurant, a retail job, making 15 to $20 an hour, maybe because they don't have the job skills per se. Like, well, what if this coding school, you know, digital coding school can help them go from 15 bucks an hour to $50 an hour by just going through a three month training program online, really easy, you know? And so we're like, Hey, let's invest in that tech, get and give every person in every one of these houses across America, you know, that's, that's needing that next job skill, because right now all the technology companies say there's like 3.6 million tech jobs open and available that are needed. So when you've got that many jobs that are open, that much availability, it's a great time to invest in that space. Anyways, that's just a couple of examples, but I love the value of putting those two things together. Yeah. And I really like that idea of combining your investments and your charity and aligning those. And I can imagine that would really multiply the, the effect even, even more than, yeah. than just the two, you know, bringing them together. Have you seen that or what is the magnitude of that? I don't have the metrics on it yet. That's one of the things we're working on is, you know, we've got some metrics we're going to be tracking. And so we're looking to, you know, get it started. I would say, I mean, in, maybe in other companies, I mean, you can look at something like, you know, the, the, you know, people that have cared a bunch about things like Bible engagement and like Bible translation, I'd say, but Bible engagement is probably the bigger one. You know, there's an app that just raised 40 million to grow called Glorify. There is $40 million from one of the larger VC funds in the country, Andreessen Horowitz, because they're doing a great job. They've got hundreds of thousands of users, many of them paying for this app. So it's for-profit, you know, app that enables better Bible engagement and helping people to have a quiet time, which sounds like, geez, I could do that for free and I don't need a technology to do that, but it's just having it, the reminder to doing it and the help walking you through it. These guys have just done it. It's, you know, the guys had a FinTech background. They were really good at growing and scaling the product and they've just seen the, the thing take off. And so, you know, that's a, a one where it's like, Hey, I'm passionate about Bible engagement or passion about the word of God being shared, invest in that heck, you know, to make it happen. Right. So before we end the lightning round, is there anything else that you are seeing that God is doing around the world that you're really excited about and want to share with our listeners? Ah, yeah. One of the most ex exciting things I've seen lately with like faith, faith driven was the expansion into Africa and Asia. Right. Um, you know, God's been obviously working in those two places for a very long time. Didn't need that organization per se to go there. And yet it's, it's been explosive to see, you know, faith driven entrepreneurs and investors all over Africa now start to, uh, to have a voice and be able to, to have a, a platform to speak from. And then even seeing local organizations starting to start up even more successfully, a, a one called Zawani, that's a local run organization kind of in partnership. And so it's really exciting to see, you know, these other parts of the world really picking up interest and excitement. I think in relation to that, you know, Europe is seeing that growth as one of our, so our teammates are in, our, our two of our managing partners are in Zurich, Switzerland and great guys, you know, serial entrepreneurs, investors. And one of when they were going to go do a faith driven investor events recently in, I think it was Prague, but it was the, the European trip that they, the, the team took. Like Henry was going to be over there. I said, Hey, you, you know, I was really hoping to connect these guys to the event and really like, you guys should go to this. Like, it's amazing that God's taking this thing over there. And they sent me a picture with the keynote speaker and they said, tell Vip, you know, we said hi or something like that. And it was funny because I mean, they were already at the event planning on being there connected to the work going on. I was like, man, it's no longer just, it's getting started. And there's, there's kind of whiffs of it from different places, but it's really neat to see that that it's bubbling up in all these different parts of the world from Indonesia to, you know, South Africa to, you know, Germany, whatever. It's, uh, it's just really exciting to see God's God hand. And I mean, and I guess, I mean, is continuing that, that line of the international piece, you know, one of the entrepreneurs that was in one of my community, virtual community groups the last two years is Ukrainian. So during this whole time, he's been in one of the cities 
that's had bomb raids, but it hasn't been as much attack in that city. And so during this, I mean, he's, you know, they're running down to the basement, you know, every other night and it's still a lot of concern. He's you know got his family, but he's still like, he emailed me the other day and was like, our company is still trying to keep our employees employed. They're in Ukraine and, and three or four other European countries. He's like, so see if you can send us some more business. You know, they do dev work and tech enabled services. They work for a lot of American companies. It's like, we can do that anywhere in the world. He was like, but I want to keep my people employed, keep them making money, keep helping them, you know, support their families and just his passion to keep being an entrepreneur and not give up even in the midst of his country and his family, you know, effectively being attacked, right? Like it's amazingly scary and yet amazing at the same time that they're, they're keeping that going. So I guess the, the summary for the rest of us would be, there's really no excuse, right? Like. If God's called us to this, he's made it plain, like, you know, why can't we, you know, take another step of faithfulness and do a little bit more today than we did yesterday? Again, back to our question, what's holding you back? And will you consider handing that over to God? Anyway. Wow. That was powerful. Vip. Thank you for that. that that's a good wrap up and we can go into our lightning round. So All right. Bring it on. What books are you reading right now and why? Right now I'm reading Delighting in the Trinity. So a book by Michael Reeves, partly because our pastor talked about it on a Sunday morning. I thought it sounded fascinating too. He was like, man, it's another facet of looking at God and trying to savor him more. We just don't think much about the Trinity and the, the true engagement. And it's awesome, honestly, to really think about the father, his love for the son and the spirit working through that. I'm not giving you much of a chance to do a lighting round. If I talk so long, I apologize for that. But I will say the other book I'm reading through right now is the book of Genesis with my son. These EF, the ESV now has these note taking by where you can buy one, one book of the Bible at a time and have notes beside it. Somebody for Christmas gave me the book of Proverbs. And I was like, he was like, Hey, you know, may God give you wisdom in your new, in your role. And so I said, I asked my son who's 11, like, Hey, would you be willing to read a chapter a day with me? We'll both take notes. So I write, you know, my name at the top or dad at the top and my note for the day. And my son writes his name and his note for the day. And we started that in Proverbs. Well, after 30 days, we read through Proverbs and I was like, would you keep doing this with me? And so I let, you know, I picked a book and he picked a book. And so we've read you know, Revelation and we've read Matthew and we've read John and, you know, we've read the book of Acts. I think John's next actually. So it's pretty fun. And my point just being whatever, you know, Bible translation you have, you can get them one book at a time. You know, they, they some of them are really small. And so, but uh, it's, it's been awesome to have that relationship with him and those kind of conversations happening. Absolutely. Yeah. And my wife and I have been talking a lot about the importance of family discipleship and discipling kids and things like that. It's really really life-changing. So next question, most unique place you've ever visited? Uh, one of my, I mean, favorite places is an island called Krabi in, well, it's a peninsula, I think, uh, Krabi or Rayleigh, Thailand. Man, no, no road, I mean, few roads, no vehicles, just flat out gorgeous. Got to take a long tail boat from, from like the coast of Thailand out to the island at Rayleigh. And it's some of the best like rock climbing and scuba diving in the world. So amazing, amazing place. Always Thailand. What's one goal or skill that you're currently working on? Hmm. Right now I'd say the goal, the skill that I'm working on is really the VC world, like trying to understand better. You now I'm joining, it's one thing to host a pitch event to get the right people in the room. It's something else to really know how to do the diligence and ask the right questions to the entrepreneur yourself, hmm. make sure you're getting the right information. I mean, just or real estate deal to really know, like, I know how to do it in real estate. I know the, you know, is the, where's the property going to be, you know, how much is the rent in the area, those kind of locations, specific things, but really in this B2B SaaS space, I'm really learning from my teammates, you know, how to diligence a, and have a long ways to go by the way. Is there anything that we or our listeners can do to help you? Sure. I, I would say, I mean, we're just trying to get out the messaging of Eagle Venture Fund, like really excited about the significant return, significant impact concept. And so, you know, we've got three funds right now. One just B2B SAT, one, which is our kind of, you know, main fund. We've got one focused on the city of Dallas, like investing just for DFW. And then the one rolling out soon is the Freedom Fund, like Google Freedom Fund that's going to focus on that, that trafficking slavery technology space. So I think just more people knowing about the fund's existence and that God's using this space for impact. And 
I've got two documents. If anybody's out there, the one on like how to process through your discovery of your passions and how to process through your investor thesis. So two documents, I send them to people all the time in PDF. If anybody would like to, you know, get those documents, they could email you and, and you could get us connected up, but it's been fun to help walk people through that conversation and help them really kind of discover what it is that they want to, you know, what it is God's calling them to be involved in on the investment side. Right. Happy to share those with you and your listeners. Yeah, we, we really appreciate that. So last question, what is one thing God is teaching you right now? Yeah, it's funny. I read this week, Psalm, I think it's 52. I'm in the fifties, but he just, there's a passage that, that talks about trusting, thanking and waiting. And it was just, you know, trust in his steadfast love. Like it's steadfast. It's not going there, you know, give thanks for all the things that he's done and then wait on the Lord. And that combination in that order, I think is pretty powerful. If you trust him and you're giving thanks to him, then you'll have the patience to wait on him, wait for his, you know, his, him to come. Yeah. So I think it's just, God's just reminding me, especially in this season of like, you know, raising capital for the funds, investing in the right, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, building things as a family, you know, this stage of life that we're in just a lot of reminding, you know, over and over again, remembering to trust him, remembering to give thanks to him, remembering to wait on him and not try to force you know, things to happen. That's some good wisdom. Thank you, Vip. And thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Hello, Vip. Thank you for coming to the bonus section and let's ask three questions from our listeners. Awesome. So the first question is in what specific areas of your life have you seen the greatest success and how have you leveraged those to make, make a significant difference? Here's a why I've seen the greatest success. Are we talking in a specific area? I mean, right now, just getting to read the Bible with my son, to me, has been a ginormous success. The fact that he's actually reading it every day was probably one of the most encouraging things I've done in a long time. Was it me? But it was also my daughter works out with me one day, Wednesday and Friday, or she has been this summer. To me personally, that has been a freaking joy just to get up, have that time with her in the car going, you know, the workout kind of laughing at each other or competing with each other. And then the conversation on the way back has just been phenomenal. Just an encouragement, like a connection level. Um, as a teenage girl, you know, there's some things we do relate to and some things I don't. So that's been just a, a fun, like personal connectivity. As far as like in our work overseas, you know, that one of the most effective things I ever did was have a conversation for, for the work in China was have a three minute conversation in a hallway in America. And I know that sounds funny, but when we came back, we were, we felt like God leading us back, you know, left the ministry, turned it over to someone else and ended up having this, this contact of mine in a hallway, stop me one day and just say, Hey, I want to introduce you to somebody who's doing some cool stuff in China. Maybe you guys could talk and see if there's, you know, any connectivity. Three minutes, ended up meeting the guy for lunch or, you know, going to visit him in his office. He was starting a, a, a website for a Chinese evangelism. But he figured out a way to get past the Chinese firewall, um, which is really, really hard to do. But they didn't have the content they needed, and they needed the few people, listener, like the few responders to get started to share about it because no one knew that right. it existed. So I, again, living in America, sent a couple, I, I sent him a video that a friend of mine had given me of like the gospel being shared really, you know, basically in Chinese. I sent, sent him an email. And then sent him an introduction to two or three people in China who then took it and blew it across within a couple years, two, three years, like 8 million people had heard the gospel Goodness. through their That's website incredible. and platform. And I only say that to say that was God's reminder to me. Like when we left China, I was like, man, we must have failed you that it was time for us to leave China. Like, why would you have caused us? Like, why would, why would we have had to leave except that we messed up? or we didn't, we're not serving you in the way that, that maybe you wanted us to. So there's a little of that struggle when we left, like, and then doing this, God just said, it doesn't matter if you're in China or not. I can use you in a three minute conversation in a hallway in Plano, Texas, more than I can use you if you'd spend in a lifetime in China. I had never reached 8 million yeah. people with the gospel. Never, I mean, never 800 people with the gospel personally, but it was just that one connection and helping. So 
he just, it was the, the, the thing I celebrate most is God just reminded me how big he is and how small I am and just how he can use any, any opportunity for availability. So anyways, there you go. More information than you needed probably, but. That was great. Really encouraging. So this is a framework question. Do you have a framework when you analyze and steward financial resources? Personally, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. I would say not officially, like I should, I think, you know, we, I would say in, in our stage of life and our career, we probably live off about 80% of what we make, 70, 80% of what we make, you know, put a little bit aside in savings, you know, you know, obviously give the, you know, the, the tithe and stuff like that. And then kind of, you know, look for opportunities for investment, but, you know, not in that stage of, of life and career where we're doing a lot of the, you know, we're, we're not accredited investors at this stage. So not doing a lot of that additional accredited investment. You know, most of our investment in faith-based things is through mutual funds and ETFs, which all of our public equities kind of investments pretty much are in, you know, things like Eventide or Guidestone or Praxis Mutual Funds, Timothy Funds, one of those that's really focused on they say the world rejoicing, but they also are like, you know, BRI type stuff or SRG type stuff. So that's, you know, kind of where we put our, our extra capital as it were investment money. Right. Yeah. So, and then the last question is, was there a specific catalyst that God has used in teaching you biblical generosity? Yeah. Stephen Cup, man, with that charity invest thing, he literally said, Hey, Bip, I think you're going to love this so much. I'll put the first 50 bucks in your account for you. And dude, I'm telling you, we've put, you know, thousands through there now. And it was just him, you know, giving us the opportunity because I'd seen, I'll say it this way. I'd seen rich people give a lot of money before, like wealthy, like people give a lot of money. And I just always thought I was like, Lord, I guess you're just not, that's not the calling you have for us. And then, then the thing that I've learned though, over these last few years is generosity is not about an amount. Generosity is about the heart. And a, a friend said not too long ago, like philanthropy is a portal to the heart of God and it's just, or to intimacy with God. That's what he said. Generosity is a portal to intimacy with God. And I, you know, initially I just didn't believe that because I was like, I don't have enough money to give, to make a dent. And it was like, no, I mean, God just showed me over and over again. No, that is not true. Like starting with the heart to give and finding joy in giving you're once you find joy in it, you're going to always get more because you realize like this can be a joyful thing. And it's so fun. Like when someone has that need, you're like, Hey, we've already set aside that capital over there and we want to be generous with it and maybe even give additionally to that. But yeah, it's, it's been that, that DAF with charity vest has been game changing for us. And just Steven's willingness to go, I believe this so much. I'm going to put 50 bucks on the account for you. Kind of like, I dare you to do something with it. Cause he knew if we found joy in giving that 50 away, we'd come back and put a few more in there. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That right there, that generosity is all about the heart. And what did you say? The portal of portal to intimacy with God portal to intimacy with God. It that right there is wor worth, worth coming on the show right there. <laughs> yeah. It was a guy from NCF shared that quote with me. I don't know who the original speech said, or it was definitely not me, but it is, it is definitely true. And we're trying to find with our kids too. I mean, these days you've got really two major things that we find in, and a lot of the investors I know have this issue, you know, where they don't want to necessarily pass their immense wealth off to their kids because they're afraid it'll screw them up. You know, typically wealth doesn't make you a better person. Wealth ex amplifies the person you currently are. Right. Um, and so it just like, if you're greedy, it just amplifies your greed. But if you're generous, it amplifies your generosity. So if you get the generosity with a little and then it's amplified, that's awesome. But if you're greedy with a little, so my point is just when, with our kids, like we're really trying to help on the, you know, the generosity side so that money doesn't become their God as they get older and technology, you know, that it, that it doesn't own them. Like many of us that where we get kind of locked into it and stuff. So those are the, probably the two biggest things we work on as a family is just trying to like Lord willing, they will love the word of God and they will not be owned by money. And that device will be a tool and not their, their life sucking organism or something like that. I think we'll find that we'll be thankful as parents and uh, consider ourselves, you know, having made a little bit of success if, if that happens.
Absolutely. Well, Vip, I'll we'll let you go, but thank you for coming on the show and Dude, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Daniel. You have a great week, buddy. All right. See you.